and uh, we are going to begin today by review and approval of the minutes. And then after that, I'm going to ask that we go out of order so that we can address the policy that Maria worked on. So we'll then discuss the policy against discrimination, harassment, sexual harassment, retaliation, and then loop back to the yearbook policy and our other agenda items. Uh, so have members had an opportunity to review the minutes from the November 9th subcommittee meeting? Yes, would someone like to move them? Yeah, I'll move them. We have a second? Second. Seconds. All right, Andy? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. And I also vote yes. All right, so the uh, minutes are approved and that will move us to a discussion of the policy against discrimination, harassment, sexual harassment, and retaliation. Uh, Maria sent me some very helpful comments and edits to the draft that we had already referred to the full committee. But uh, even though we've already referred it, I think that the full committee would appreciate if we go over the refinements, the additions and modifications that Maria uh, made. Maria already provided some explanation uh, to the full committee on that, but I'll give you a chance again, Maria, if you'd like to um, summarize what the modifications and changes were and why you felt they were necessary. So I think this policy is a very important policy, um, but the catalyst for looking at it and, and ensuring that, um, you know, that uh, it, it's in compliance with the new Title IX regulations, but it's important that Title IX doesn't overshadow the others, right? Uh, all discrimination, all harassment is unacceptable. And uh, so I think that that is really the, the important um, part that I wanted to, to reflect in, in the policy, but also it's, it can be very confusing as other members have talked about. Um, and that was an important uh, aspect as well is, is people should come look at our policy and it should be clear what, what, where we stand um, and what they should do and, and the rights that they have. So it should be very clear. Um, in, in those respects as well. So those were the, the um, you know, reasons why I felt, you know, looking at it again, kind of thinking about it through those lenses, um, you know, and just making those additional recommendations. And uh, having gone through them and incorporated, I, I think nearly all of your uh, edits, I, I feel that this is a much better draft now. I'm very comfortable with it. I hope that the full committee will agree. Uh, Andy, do you have some thoughts on the updated version of this draft? Uh, no, the, I think Maria's changes look good to me as well. I, I, I do still have a couple of general questions about the scope of this policy that I think they're questions that we've had from the very beginning. Um, like namely, uh, I mean, you mentioned Maria that the Title IX coordinator is also responsible for kind of handling complaints of, about harassment of all kinds. Uh, I guess it, it's still not resolved, or at least I don't yet understand, like, are, are we going to be treating other forms of harassment sort of with the same uh, procedures as we are now adopting for sexual harassment? Um, and possibly a related question is, uh, like, uh, like, there's also, we also have a bullying policy. And so what's the, what's the demarcation between applying this one and applying that one? Um, so all of these have been just kind of very vague to me from the beginning, and uh, I'm wondering if we can finally sort of get that straight, at least in my mind. So, so the, to that point, go ahead, go ahead David. Oh, go ahead, Maria. I was going to the, refer it to you and Casey anyway. Go ahead. <laughs> so um, as far as you know, um, the Title IX coordinator um, really is encompasses more than Title IX, right? So so it is Title. Um, you know, uh, Title VI, Section 504. So we're looking at, you know, all the different classes, disabilities. Um, so from that respect, the Title IX coordinator does look at the, um, any complaints or, uh, you know, um, when somebody feels like there might be a policy violation, uh, looking at where, what direction to go in. So that's one kind of one question, like, the Title IX coordinator is larger than just Title IX. Um, we do have to specifically put Title IX in in the uh, job just in the um, person's uh, description. That's part of the the new regulation. Um, and then the other piece of that is 
the Title IX regulations are very specific and um, dense. Uh, there, we wouldn't be able to uh, handle every single uh, policy violation in that respect. Um, so it's important to understand one of the roles of the Title IX coordinator is to, when a, a complaint comes in, to understand, are we going to uh, remedy this through the, the Title IX process, or are we going to remedy this through, uh, I can say like a plan B, right? This is the other, for all other um, uh, civil rights processes. So um, I guess uh, part, of the, the, part of the policy is that we need to set out very explicitly what the procedures are for handling Title IX complaints. Uh, I'm wondering if, if for the other types of harassment, even if it's not exactly the same procedure, is, are we also going to be setting those procedures out in, in, as, ex, in, in as explicitly as we do for the Title IX uh, complaints? And then also like when, when does something then fall under bullying? Uh, and, and is sort of covered under that, uh, under that policy and those procedures to begin with. I think I just, I, I wanted to just say the one thing about the kind of like making sure the, the procedures doesn't interfere with the policy, right? Because the procedures is gonna be much more detailed yeah. um, and we just focus on the policy here because if we uh, kind of mingle the two, I think that's where it starts to get confusing as well. Sure. So the, I just want to the, the policy does say that we will set the superintendent will determine a bunch of procedures like that have to comply with this that and the other and be consistent with this that and the other. So, it, but I think it says that only specifically for sexual harassment complaints, right? That we need to set out this procedure. So, uh, are we are we, are we going to handle? Are we going to leave other forms of harassment sort of unaccounted for in this way, or, or like are there already explicit procedures for handling those? Uh, I think, I think because of, of the complexity of Title IX, we really mm -hmm. have to look at the procedures that we follow for the other forms of harassment and, and discrimination and ensure that, that it is clear um, for folks uh, w when they're looking at it, um, you know, which direction that they would go. And, and of course, you know, frontline response is, you know, if somebody has a complaint, who they go to, and then uh, the coordinator goes through all of the policies uh, or all of the procedures with that person to ensure that they understand them and know all of their rights. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it be, might be worth it writing something like that into this policy, just to make it clear, like if a particular complaint doesn't fall under Title IX, then what should, uh, you know, what will happen at that point and who's responsible and, and what will they, what procedures well, what, whether, whether those procedures will need to be spelled out as explicitly as they do for sexual harassment complaints. At least reading it over, that was sort of a gap for me in my understanding. And, and I'm imagining myself as a family sort of wondering, you know, what's gonna happen next. Yeah. All right, Jennifer, do you have any thoughts? on the policy as a whole or on what Andy's commenting about the intersectionality with uh, the bullying policy and other policies, scope? Um, yeah, I think just making sure that the procedures are clear, I think to Andy's point, I think that when, and which is not what we're gonna do tonight, but just sort of reiterating that the procedures, just like we, I, I do like some of the changes to the policy. I do like really sort of making making more of a statement about a broad statement about harassment um and i really thought that was a, a nice addition sort of like clarifying that language because it was very heavy um on certain kinds of discrimination and harassment so i do think that was a nice change and um i, I do think it can be confusing um for members of the it's different right when when people are involved in it at, at, at like the administrative level or even you know uh, um, educators right now needing to implement parts of the policy or reporting procedures. I think that's different than community members who are taking a look at the policy and trying to navigate the policy and the procedures. And so I just think to reiterate to Andy's point, just making sure that they're really clear, just like this policy is much clearer, I think, than it was when we started. And we know that, you know, a lot of the documentation can be very um, I think as Marie was saying, the pre-existing policies or forms are very text heavy and very dense and, and hard to maneuver. And I think this is a it, policy is much clearer. I'm, I'm much happier with it the way that it is now. 
I just want to make sure that the procedures are all, you know, just to support the idea that the procedures, procedures should be clear. And I think to your point, delineated between like, this is this path. And then if this, if you don't qualify here, you follow this path. And so sort of like a flow chart, like, like you might say, like, if the answer is yes to this question, you go here. And if it's no, you go over here. And if the next question is yes, you go here. And so, uh, yes, like a decision tree sort of just popped up on my chat. Yes. Yeah, so sort of like a flow chart might be helpful for members of the community, but that's just a suggestion because it's really a procedures thing and not, not my purview. Um, but that would be my just my support for that idea of just really delineating the, the initial steps. And I think it'd be great to reiterate in there that someone will walk people through that. And I think um, I think that's an important part of the training too, is to make sure that whatever staff are implementing or supervising, you know, the administrators for this, um, just make sure that they know that part of the work that needs to be done is helping to educate um, students or family or staff in the process. Sorry, that was a lot of words, David, sorry. Well, I appreciate that. So in terms of this decision tree, flow chart, and some kind of guide for members of the community to be able to follow, when do we think something like that would be produced and who exactly would be producing that? So I am working on that right now. Um, I just wanna make sure from a policy perspective that um, nothing, um, that it's it they they complement each other right that there's not a conflict with each other um so i can provide a preliminary you know uh flow chart and then that could be adjusted afterwards if needed based on what the policy ends up passing uh, casey do you have anything you'd like to add no i don't think so i'm just trying to work through the what a decision tree would look like. I think sometimes it's really hard when you have a situation with harassment, um, you really have to get into the details a bit, uh, into the case and what happened to determine what, um, what laws were broken, what regulations were not followed, like, um, you know, that helps you go down that path. And, and it's seldom that clean that, yes, this is just sexual harassment. And so I wanna make sure that whatever we put in front of the public, um, that it's something that's useful that doesn't actually drive folks unnecessarily down one way when we actually might have to be taking two paths down the decision tree. Um, so that's just sort of my internal thoughts, my thought process, but I, you know, sorry about this. He clearly wants to play. Um, but um, I, I, I just wanna work with Maria a bit on that first before we put something, um, in front of the, the subcommittee, but I think we're happy to do it. Um, I don't know if we can promise January, um, but we can talk with, um, Maria and I can talk and we can back, come back to you, David. Jennifer? Yeah, that's, you know, that's a really good point, Casey. And I'm just wondering if there's anything in the training, mat training materials that staff, I know we talked about like staff being trained and I just wonder if there's anything that would, is helpful in those materials that we could use to help at least help community members, family members, students, staff, whoever it is, sort of find an entry point. Like, should I be maybe looking at this more as, you know, I don't know, some, and just helping people navigate an entry point. Like this might be more bullying. This might, if these are the set of stir, like how would staff members sort of, you're right, it's, it's a little bit complicated. Sometimes it might be more than one thing and there might be more than one path. Um, and, and I'm just wondering what might be in those training materials. This is just a thought of that might be helpful and, and, and applicable to community members or students in understanding where they should enter this process. And maybe it's just you get, you, you notify people at the school and they will have a conversation with you about what this is. And maybe that's as far as we can get right now on a, on a tree, but I do think it might be helpful for people to sort of see that there are different paths and maybe that's the flow chart is not a yes, no chart, but just sort of these are possible paths and these are maybe ways that they intersect yes. just so people can understand that it's a little bit complicated, but there are parameters and there are guidelines. Yep. I, don't know if that's yep. I think that's a great idea. Andy? Yeah, I mean, on this uh, question of there being multiple paths, I'm just wondering, like, if we were starting everything from scratch, right, and not trying to sort of rebuild the ship while we're sailing it, like, would we have separate policies for harassment and bullying? Or is that sort of a historical relic? Uh, 
I don't know, actually. I mean, that might come when new legislation comes, when it's updated, like when the bullying laws were updated, school districts updated those processes. Now Title IX has changed a bit, so now we're updating them. So I don't know if there's ever, I guess we, we, when we update, we are, um, we're responding to something that has changed. It's just, for me, it's confusing that, you know, I would go to the policy manual and there's this separate thing and, and we're told that bullying is a form of harassment, but we have a whole separate policy for bullying. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I don't want to make work that's purely for like aesthetic reasons, but it does seem odd where I don't understand like what the scope is of each of these two policies and how much they overlap. Um, yeah. I mean, if the problem that we're trying to solve is clarity for the community in terms of here are the different types of harassment um, or it, that, that we look into and here's who to contact and here's the process for each. If, if that's the clarity, then I think we can put something like that together. I think what's hard is if we are walking someone, if, if, the, uh, if, we're, if the document that we are creating is to try to walk folks through what regulation fits under the incident. Mm -hmm. That's hard. Yeah, no, it's definitely the clarity for the community that I would, that I personally prioritize here. So I, I guess if 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 that flowchart can just sort of draw on both policies, like where, wherever appropriate, then I guess that would that would be all right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just, you know, the more that Andy's talking, I'm like, oh, that is such a good question. When is it harassment and when is it bullying, and what's the difference between? Well, yeah. I'm like, uh, yeah, I mean, that's why we train staff, right? Because that's like, you know, for certain people at the high school, I can tell you certain deans, that's all that they're doing is trying to decipher. Um, one thing I, I did remember to uh, Andy, just back to your question real quick, is that the law actually mandates that there are separate policies. On sort of a macro level, how would you distinguish between bullying and harassment? What is something that you think would be governed by the bullying policy as uh, an example, as opposed to being governed by the harassment policy? Yeah. You're asking a specific I mean, question. Of, again, discrimination, I can, I, I can see the distinction there. So you can bully someone on something that doesn't pertain to their race or their gender, or you're bullying them yeah. about their clothing, for example. Yep. So I see yep. that, but bullying versus harassment, that's less clear. Yeah, I mean, I think it's what you just listed, right? So a protected class is covered by the broader point of harassment, but bullying does not cover it. Yeah, and that's so exactly. A, so if I'm a school administrator, I'm looking at that distinction. And then that will tell me, you know, how I invest, what, my steps. I guess, uh, that, that I follow. Right, to Casey's point, that's exactly what I was uh, gonna say as well. It's really those, the protected classes, those civil rights um, components when we were looking at, um, you know, the, the harassment and discrimination policy versus bullying. Are we saying that bullying when it concerns protected classes then becomes harassment and not bullying? Or no, we're not saying that. We're saying both. We're saying yeah. it's bullying, but it, it and, also includes and, right. Right, so typically we'll see, I mean, I guess more often than not, we will see a complaint of bullying come in. And then um, when an administrator investigates, they find more specifically what one student said to another student. And then you find out a little bit more how long it's been happening. And once you get all the details, you begin to think like, well, I think that's actually a protected class based on what was said. So now we're looking at not just a bullying investigation, investigation but whether or not um, harassment is, uh, we're looking at it uh, from, a different, from a different lens. I guess this is like a duality that we live with in the criminal justice system too, right? You can be charged with a crime for sort of the act, but then you can also be charged with a civil rights violation, you know, based on the, the, both the, the motivations for that act. Okay, this is complicated. So, yeah. It is, it's not easy. On the no, but basically if you are bullying or harassing someone because of their race and you can tell during the investigation that that's what it is, it would fall under the harassment discrimination policy. If the bullying pertains to, there's a student who just doesn't like people who wear hats, that's not a protected class, but it's still bullying. 
Right, but I think in your first example, it falls under both. All right, any other questions regarding the discrimination, harassment, retaliation policy? We do have a- Sorry, uh, David, I'm sorry. Did you, um, did you have any other feedback from, does this draft incorporate feedback from community members as well as from staff? I'm just curious if there's any other issues that we haven't discussed yet. In terms of from staff, I'm not sure. From community members, uh, I did receive some input, but it was more along the lines of uh, ass wanting assurance that the procedures will be very clear so that members of the public can follow along what to do when, which gets back to that decision tree conversation. That seemed to be what I heard most about in terms of public comment. And then also we have public comment today about how uh, vulnerable populations, such as nonverbal students, uh, making sure that they would be covered by this. I, I, I think obviously they would be covered by this. And I think the question is getting more at how would we ensure that nonverbal students are able to communicate in some way or somebody on their behalf that there's harassment taking place and what are the procedural safeguards and mechanisms that we have in place for that? Uh, perhaps Maria or Casey could comment on that. Yeah, that, that, I think I'd have to speak more to schools in terms of procedurally. I'm just not close enough to the cases. Um, where it involves a student who's nonverbal to find out. Or even if it's not to that extreme, but it's a young child who is not in a position to be able to fully explain what has transpired, but mm -hmm. perhaps there is someone else who does have a sense of it, either because uh, he or she was a witness to it or based on prior experience, the child's behaviors are manifesting in such a way that would suggest that they're, uh, that the student might be a, a victim of some kind. Uh, so what are our current practices around that? Yeah, so um, I know that our counselors and psychologists have been involved um, when we have a student who's either too young to express him or herself or um, uh, just has a, a different learning style where they can't express themselves as easily. Um, and so there are different ways to interview a student um, to get more information um, about, about an incident. And to your knowledge, have there been instances where an educator or a counselor uh, brings an, an allegation of harassment to the attention, uh, to your attention or to uh, the administrative level? in terms of potential bullying, harassment, discrimination on behalf of someone else? You mean an adult who has come to me on behalf of somebody who they, who right, they uh, believe has uh, been uh, bullied? Is, yes. Not I necessarily to you personally, but to, to, to someone in a supervisory capacity. Yeah, so, certainly. So, We've, yeah. Ahead, Maria. So, so, Right, um, so I um, regularly work with the counselors um, and the principals. So um, a student might say something, you know, a little bit of something and to a teacher or, or to a counselor that, that makes us go, hmm, what, what else is going? You know, what more is there? Um, and then depending on who that initial, uh, the, you know, let's say hypothetically it was first reported to the teacher, the teacher usually loops in either the counselor or the principal to say, you know what, this, this kind of bothered me, this student reported this, and then it, it gets passed off so that either a, a counselor or a psychologist, whoever works with that student most, um, has those connections with the student, is able to, to talk to the student, get more information so that we can determine, you know, is, is there more here? Do we need to investigate further? Um, you know, how do we remedy this for the student as well? So yes, on a, reg on a pretty regular basis, if, if you know, something comes up when, where the student is, might be um, you know, on the young side or uh, might have uh, different uh, disabilities, uh, different uh, staff members do loop each other in to, to get more information to, to ensure that we're uh, not only supporting the student, but also um, how, how do we remedy this as well? 
Okay. And in terms of Jennifer's question about staff input, do we have any staff input on these uh, um, policies? Not to my knowledge, I don't think we've put this in front of staff. When the bullying policy was being worked on, do you recall whether there was staff input on that? I wasn't here when that um, was uh, renewed, but um, I was for the discipline policy um, and, uh, or the code of conduct rather, um, and we did have a, at least one round of feedback from staff. And to this more broad question about feedback, whether it's from staff or members of the public, uh, there is a member of the public who had asked me for our approximate timetable on getting this policy approved and opportunities to uh, provide more input. So we are next going to be taking this up at the full school committee meeting on the 17th. It's possible that we could uh, vote on this on that date. Uh, so for those of you who are watching now or for those of you who are watching now and would like to share with others, uh, please don't hesitate to send your input. Uh, you can send it to our executive assistant, Robin Coyne, or you can also email it to me or, or really any of us who are at this meeting, and uh, we will definitely take it into consideration and review it. And I do think it would be a good idea, if possible, to uh, send this out so that's to uh, everyone who has a PSB email address, to uh, faculty and staff so that they can have an opportunity uh, for any input that they would like to provide. And that way we know that this is a reflection or at least that everyone had a chance uh, to comment if they would have wished to. All right, any other comments or questions, concerns on this policy before we move on to the next topic? No? All right, thank you very much, Maria. I'm glad we were able to accommodate your schedule and get this done in time. Thank you, good night. Good night. All right, so next up, we are going to discuss the yearbook policy. Uh, there is an updated draft that many of you received only about a couple hours ago. My apologies on that. However, uh, this updated draft does reflect a lot of the public input that I received since our last discussion. Uh, also, we have with us today uh, as one of our panelists, Lori Lynn, who is the yearbook advisor at Brookline High School. It had been recommended the last time that we discussed this that we include uh, those who might be affected by this policy change. I had reached out to Ms. Lynn uh, last week and uh, she accepted the invitation to come here today to participate in this meeting and this discussion. Uh, if she would like to participate more actively, we could elevate her to panelist. Um, Ms. Lynn, you can just write down in the chat if you would like to be promoted to panelist. Uh, and if you would, we would be happy to hear from you. Okay. All right. So Robin, could you elevate uh, Lori Lynn to panelist? Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi. Uh, so Ms. Lynn, could you uh, introduce yourself to us and what your role is with the yearbook and explain how that works currently? Yeah, um, so I'm Lori Lynn. I'm a visual arts teacher at BHS, and this is my second year as the yearbook advisor. Um, it's a club, and uh, we meet um, about three times a week with students on who um, participate on a volunteer basis. Um, it's pretty much, you know, how it works for now. I, I, I read the um, policy and, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to talk about this with all of you. So thank you for inviting me. All right, welcome. So one of the reasons why this is being proposed currently uh, is we really want to make sure that all children, all of our students feel like they are included and that all of them are memorialized for posterity so that in the future when they want to look back at their yearbook, they see that they were there, they were part of the community, their peers can see they're a part of the community. And uh, I, I think that most of us have positive intentions. I, I would like to think that there uh, wasn't any intention behind the occasional instances of where someone has been excluded or where a uh, quote has been misappropriated or where certain mistakes or lapses 
were made. And this policy, the, the goal of it really is to try to make sure that, that those types of situations don't happen again, and that we have full inclusion, that we have equity, and that all of our students, whether they're in general education or special education or whatever the individual situation might be, uh, are full-fledged members of our community. So that's really the impetus for this policy. Um, that being said, it, it was raised at the last meeting that there could be some potential unintended consequences of implementing the policy as currently drafted, either in the previous version or the current one, just around some of the practical issues about how yearbooks are published. Uh, I'm not fully acquainted with what those implications would be exactly, so that's one of the reasons why you're invited here today to try to explain that and whether uh, you have any concerns in particular on the policy and uh, adherence to it if it were to pass. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, um, so do you guys wanna, um, do, you, do you want me to say something? I'm sorry, should I, should I respond to that or are you guys just gonna start talking about the policy? If you would like, so I, I think you had a chance to at least review the last version. Today's came to you pretty late, I understand that, but based on what you've reviewed, is there anything in particular that you think would be difficult to implement in time for this year or um, if not this year in the future? Um, yeah, okay, so I did read the um, most recent version and I hear what you're saying. I think that the whole idea, everything that you just said, I totally agree with, you know, that we want this to be um, an inclusive um, document, you know, we want everyone to feel like they're a part of it and we really wanna to try to avoid those mistakes that can happen. Um, and, you know, last year I'm aware of one or two mistakes in our yearbook and even with, you know, some of the policies that you've put in are, are things that we're already practicing. Um, we still had um, one name mistake that I'm aware of, you know, and my goal was to have no name mistakes and we tried so hard and there were multiple adults um, reviewing the, the names and still um, we had a mistake. So, you know, whatever we can do to make that not happen again is really, you know, something I'd like to be a part of. So in terms of um, practical issues, I guess I would say, um, I can just kind of go through a little bit. Um, uh, but I just wanna have the document open so that I can see my notes and that at the same time. Um, okay, so in inclusion, um, the third uh, exception, it says that um, PSB shall comply with any court orders preventing or restricting publication of student's name, picture, and other identifying information. You know, um, as just as an art teacher, I don't really have that kind of information available to me. So how would I be able to identify those students? Um, I would need to be working with someone who does have access to that information you know, in X2, which is where we find all of our student information, I only have access to students who are enrolled in my classes. Beyond that, I have to request information from, you know, someone like Amy Steele or Kelly McDermott, you know, they are often give me student lists that they can generate from X2. And so that would be, you know, information that I would have to know of. And the written opt out, you know, I would want to know exactly what the requirements are for that. Who, and I think it said who it should be sent to. I think it was, I don't remember who the opt out should be sent to. Um, but I guess that's another thing, just having some kind of system in place so that uh, I'm aware of who's opting out. Like I got a couple of those requests last year, students who requested not being a part of it. And I checked that with Hal Mason and he said that was okay if they wrote an email to opt out. So that's another thing that I think just needs a little more detail in terms of how you want um, people to go about that and who they should contact. Because right now I'm seen as the contact for the high school yearbook. So those things would probably come to me. If they shouldn't come to me, I'll need to know who they should be directed to. Um, and then, um, do you want me to keep moving on or do you guys want to respond to that? Okay. Um, when it came to content, 
I guess I would like some guidance on what is considered to be lewd or inappropriate because I think that can be defined um, you know, differently depending on the person who's reading it. Um, last year, I did have some students in their senior quote, they wanted to include swears or um, they even would put like the first letter and then a few asterisks. And I didn't allow any of that. I just figured, you know, I, and I wrote to them and said, I can't publish this, but you can send me an alternative quote. And I gave them multiple opportunities to do that. And then if they didn't respond, I just, you know, and I let them know if you don't send me anything else, I will just leave it blank for your quote. Um, so they were aware that I wasn't including it. Um, but there was, uh, there were other things that were sort of more in the gray area of like with strong language um, that I think the way that it's been worded in the policy, I don't know, I, I guess I'm, I guess it would be nice to have more clarity on what is defined um, as mm -hmm. um, insulting toward another member of the community. You know, I think some people could find something insulting and others might not. Um, and um, And then the other thing is um, they also added that I should uh, let people let not only the student know, but um, parents, guardians, or caretakers. I'm very happy. Um, I'm very happy to do that, but I would need access to that information. I don't have access to those contacts right now. So it's another piece of like, how do I contact those people? Um, and then in the third part, I'm still in content right now. Um, in the third part of content, um, a final copy of the yearbook shall be cross-checked um, with both class lists and opt-out lists to ensure accuracy by two adults prior to submission for publication. I can say that we had at least three adults looking at it before uh, last year. So I think that the process needs to be, I don't honestly think that's enough. I think, you know, it's very hard to know of, you know, around 500 students. And um, there probably isn't a single adult in the building that knows every student by name. Um, so I think there actually needs to be um, more oversight to ensure the accuracy of names. You know, it was a major, major disappointment to have. It was just a one letter mistake. Um, but even with that, it was just awful to have. It wasn't like a fully incorrect name, but it was one letter and that's not someone's name. It should be right. And it was just, you know, uh, horrible to have had that happen. Um, so I would also need to know um, in that part, um, the class list used to generate the yearbook shall be retained by the district for one year um, after distribution of the book. I don't know who would be retaining that or who I would submit that to. Um, so that would need to be clear to me. Um, in proprietary, um, there was one piece about um, Okay, so um, identify, identifiable individuals portrayed in any photographs must provide advanced written consent in order for photographs to be included. Um, I think when it comes to candid images that are submitted from our students, um, it's difficult to get them it, first of all, it's just difficult to get them to share images. It's a major effort to rally everyone to get them to share good content. Um, and sometimes you only get an image and sometimes you get an image and names. Um, and sometimes it's a parent who photographed an event, you know, and there's lots of people in the image. So I think that is a huge task to get um, written consent from everyone. I think it would actually be um, more beneficial not to target, look at the images and try to say who's in this picture, who isn't, but just to get consent or um, opt out and opt out for, across the board. 
and then try to do our best to not include the, I mean, I, and then not including those students would also be tricky because then those students would have to be identified um, because they could be in a picture without knowing it, they could be in the background of a picture, you know? So I guess that's a little bit of a concern for me that that's a little tricky to ensure that everyone could um, give written consent that they can, that they're, you know, okay with being in the yearbook. Um, and then under equity, um, there was a piece about homeschool students um, being included, which is fine. You know, I'm very happy to include them. I just want to know if they're on our, you know, official school list of students or if they're on a separate list. Like when I request, you know, students who are enrolled at BHS, are those students being included on that list? Um, and, and how do I get them if not? Um, and then the last bit under equity that I made a note about, I just want to read it again. Yeah, I just found the very last piece, equity number four. I was a little bit confused about that language. Um, So basically said that if a student doesn't respond by the deadline to a yearbook submission request, the teacher shall both remind the student and contact the parents, guardians, or caretakers about yearbook inclusion. Um, you know, and that makes sense to me. Like if I request information and or if images and they don't give it to me, I can follow up. But then it says um, if they don't comply with the opt-out provisions. Um, within a reasonable time period prior to the publication, then the editor shall publish the student's name and include the official yearbook headshot of the student if available. I just think those two things are a little bit different because the students don't submit their like ID picture to go into the yearbook. You know, we have pages and pages of the, the school pictures that are created. That comes to me from the company that shoots the photos. They create, you know, um, a whole archive of the images that they shot on school picture days. And then that comes to me with student names. And then we cross check that with the preferred name list and make sure that that's all right. And then a lot of students check those names. So I don't actually really request those images. And I kind of think those are the images you're talking about. Am I right? Yes, I'm referring to the pictures from the yearbook company that you would receive. So if a student participated on the a yearbook photo shoot day, but just didn't fill out any of the paperwork and then sort of disappeared, the presumption would be inclusion, not exclusion. That's what I'm trying to aim at here. Oh, absolutely. And I would say that's already the case. I mean, I think a lot of what you have in here is already the case. You know, like I really want as many students as possible to be represented. Um, you know, I've reached out to last year, I really made an effort to include more groups than had been included in recent years. Um, we did a section about METCO. We did a section about um, Steps to Success. We did a section about um, the uh, Lunar New Year celebration. We did, um, we did a club section, which hadn't been included in a while. Like we're really trying to broaden the representation of students in the book in general. And we're trying to show more candid images from all grade levels, not just seniors. Um, this year we're reaching, because of the pandemic and remote and hybrid learning, we're reaching out to students in new ways. Every single student is getting a request to share in a fun um, segment in the yearbook to share personal photos and um, statements um, just about their lives and their experiences. Um, and that's, you know, like, a, a huge thing that we're trying to accomplish right now is to get as many responses as we can um, from, from students throughout the school. So that absolutely, um, we, we want to have inclusion. It's just the, with the word request, um, because I don't request those images from students. I request, I don't request school pictures from students and I, I don't have a need to, um, because they're provided to me from someone else, not from the students. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, but those were just the main, those were the things when I read through that I made a note of like, okay, I have a question about that. Everything else made perfect sense and already fit along with like, you know, 
the, the way that I've been approaching things or trying to. Okay. Uh, we do have a question from the public about um, K-8 level yearbooks. Would you know about how those differentiate from the high school? No, I'm really sorry. I'm still relatively new at this. this is only my second year and I haven't, uh, you know, it's my fifth year at BHS, but, but second at uh, as yearbook advisor. And I haven't been in contact with any um, yearbook advisors um, from any of the other schools. I, that would be great in the future to coordinate with them, but you know, it just hasn't happened yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, Andy or Jennifer, do you have any thoughts on anything that uh, Ms. Lynn said or in general about this yearbook policy draft? Do have one question. I'm just pulling it up behind uh, my other screen here. Sorry, David. Okay. Um, it was an acronym that was on the like one of the last pages, and I was like, I don't think I know what that is. Um, is it LEA? Yeah. I, I I just think if I don't know if I wasn't sure what that was, and I was trying to figure it out. I'm like, come on, I'm, I can figure this out. Um, and I was like, you know what? I think we maybe could just spell that out. Um, I had to, I assumed it was there. It was the homeschool, but I, what's the acronym for? It's local educational agency, um, which is, which typically references the district. Um, I do wonder if we need it there. I would say either one of two options, like either to like spell it out literally, or, or I don't know if we need it or not. So well, the idea is that students who are in who are being homeschooled should have the opportunity to be included in their grade yearbook at their, I, I mean, homeschool neighborhood school, right? I think is what we're trying it's, to say it's, there. Yeah, it's their districted school wherever they would go if they came. Right. 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 And then I'm just to which curious they would about, have been assigned. Yeah. No, that makes sense. And I think whatever language that we use to describe whatever that is, and if we're going to use the acronym, I think we, I don't know, maybe we could just sort of, I think it needs to be clarified. However, we want to resolve that. I don't think we can just leave it LEA. Um, but I'm just wondering about the homeschool thing, putting in the yearbook, like most groups are by their homeroom. Like where, how, what would that look like? What if it's just, what if only like do the homeschool kids have to opt in or opt out? I guess they own, they would be in unless they opt out, which would be sort of a change. I don't, I just don't know if homeschool students are typically included now and, and, and I'm fine with whatever people, you know, with, with whether or not families want to opt in. I'm just wondering, would that be like its own homeroom? Would it be like all the homeschool students for like the grade or for the school? Like, I just don't want to see one kid on a page by themselves. That's all. I'm just, just trying to create community and figure out what that, I don't need to decide what that looks like, but I think we need to think about, someone needs to think about what that would look like. So just to clarify, Jennifer, this is aimed more at situations and years where we would not have a remote learning academy and a student is out for an extended period of time and is being homeschooled, not so much because he or she wants to be homeschooled more broadly speaking, but due to a medical issue, for example, or so they're not really in school, but they would have been, but for whatever is keeping that student at home for that year. Is that so it's different more though? Is that a homeschool? Is a student who's medically fragile and getting support from the school is not, that's not homeschool. Homeschool, I think traditionally is, is families and students who intentionally elect to homeschool and not come to school. So that, that was to me was like, I just wasn't sure how that fit into the yearbook because they're not really part of the community because if you choose homeschool you you don't even I don't think you can't even participate in the sports so I think maybe listening to you David you're talking about like another group of students that are that I don't think I would call homeschool students so maybe we could clarify that all right uh, Mary Ellen um yeah I was going to make a similar point homeschool students who are labeled homeschool are not registered students of the district. I think the distinction, David, you made about a student who is a registered student, but receiving home services, that is our, one of our students are a registered student and we're responsible for them. Um, so I think that terminology we need to be careful with because homeschool is actually, a, is not a 
PSB student. They're not our students. They're not read. We don't count them in our enrollment. They're totally a separate school. They're totally on their own. Um, but those students who are registered students who are receiving home services, um, absolutely. I think that's the point of that language. Um, so yeah, we need to be careful on that, to be very specific on that. So maybe it's home services is the language, not homeschool. Sorry about home that. Home services, we might confuse though with, we, have, we do have students who have behavioral home services that we call home services. But they're registered students still, aren't they? Or no, are they students of other schools like private schools or? Um, both actually. Okay, yeah, so I yeah. Um, we need to work on, um, on that. I Because the point is a, is a great point that we need to make sure that those students who are our registered students um, are included, even if they're not. So have a language such as uh, registered PSB students who are being provided with services with services or tutoring by PSB at home or where would we put in the at home being provided at home with services or tutoring by PSB should be offered the opportunity to be represented in the yearbook of their neighborhood school this districted school neighborhood school yeah they have to be registered students i think that's the key but and David, I might also just say, um, I think you had at home in the language. We have some students who are hospitalized. Um, so maybe just out of school. Okay. Registered PSB students who are being provided with services or tutoring by PSB outside of school should be offered the opportunity to be represented in the yearbook. Okay. Uh, Ms. Lynn? I just want to go back to Jennifer's question really quickly. Um, I, I can't speak to the K to eight um, yearbooks, but I can say in high school, we list them by their graduation year. Um, that that is uh, that you know is put into their the system in X two, and um, we don't list them by any kind of homeroom. They're just alphabetical by um, graduation year, so that wouldn't single anyone out uh, in an image. And I thought that was a really thoughtful point of yours so we don't we didn't do anything like that that's awesome to hear I think that just as my in my experience as a parent I don't know that the k-8 model follows the high school model so um, as far as by home it is as far as my experience has been it's been by homeroom um, I'm, I've yet to foray into mid, I'm now in the middle school and we didn't have yearbooks last year that well I guess actually some of us did um, so I don't know what that looks like um, on paper copy, but um, I think it's just something to think about. And I actually think that it's much clearer to me now that we've talked about what homeschool means, because I was just kind of, I want to include everyone, but that just, I, I wasn't understanding because those students are specifically elected not to attend the program. So I, I understand now. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. That's very helpful to know. And I'm looking forward to the high school. <laughs> Okay. Uh, now getting to some of Lori's earlier points, in terms of how we get information to our yearbook editors, do you have any suggestions on that, Casey? I'm guessing this is something that would come out more in the uh, procedures, although we could have a line in the policy that specifies that someone will promulgate procedures for providing access to necessary information. I think that latter part makes sense. A lot of it, I think, will come from um, uh, clerical staff who have this information, um, court orders and things like that. And I think yearbook editors certainly don't need to know um, why, but they certainly should have the list of students where there are special circumstances, um, either to be included or not to be included in a yearbook and what to include and not include. So I do think we need some tight um, procedures around that because I think things like this can be easily missed. I think, Lori, that would be helpful. I think you had mentioned there are a couple of folks at the high school who you go to, um, who you rely on to give you um, lists. And I think those folks certainly have that information because if there are any um, 
court documents or anything specific they need to know for students coming in and out of the building. Okay, well, I can add that to my requests to them, but it would be great to just um, know for sure that they're the best people to ask. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Jennifer. I was just going to say some of the questions I think that Lori has are more procedural than than policy based, but then you know we need someone who's going to sort of create those procedures which leads me to the K-8 schools. Um, and there was a comment in the chat about, you know, it looks different at different schools, sort of this, my summary line. And so does this policy create consistency across schools? Are we now mandating a yearbook for each school? Or are we just saying, if you opt in, here are the rules? So I don't think we're mandating it because in the very beginning, it's basically saying only if a yearbook is published for that grade, does any of this apply? So if one's not published, then this procedure is not relevant for that situation. Uh, in terms of Lori's um, concern around what qualifies as lewd and libelous, Unfortunately, even the US Supreme Court doesn't have a perfect answer for that. So for example, in a parallel situation around pornography, they say basically we know it when we see it. Um, so I think that's why I included the discretionary language. So at the very end of that paragraph, it says the deputy superintendent of student services shall designate an adult staffer, could be you, as the final authority on the exercise of this discretion. Uh, because as you said, it's not always really clear. It can be a close call and in one instance, just hypothetically, maybe a swear would be okay, but in another instance, it would not, just depending on the broader context. Yeah, it would just be really important for me to know if I am that person or if it's someone else, because right now I'm, you know, kind of mostly making those decisions, but working with Hal Mason um, as like, you know, someone that I trust to go to who I feel has a good sense of, you know, um, what's okay and what isn't. Um, so he and I reviewed all the um, quotes um, and submissions from last year. And so, and that would also be important for me to know if it's going to be part of this year because the seniors are submitting their quotes, you know, within the next, their deadline is January 31st. So that'll be coming up soon. Uh, any other comments, Jennifer? Sorry, and I said I was going to try to be quiet tonight to myself. Um, in the procedures for this, will there be some sort of training for people who are advisors so that they would know that these are the new rules or not new rules, whatever, I don't, the updated policy, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know if yearbook editors change from year to year at the K eights. It sounds like Lori, you've been doing it for the last two years at BHS, um, but certainly we would have to go through. Um, we'd have to notify the principals. I don't know what the training would look like, other than going through the exact pieces of the policy um, and then what procedures come out of it. So um, certainly, I don't. I also don't know how yearbook editors are selected at the K to eight. My understanding is that the principals don't have a ton of involvement in it, and it's the individuals who take it who take on the project. All right, Jennifer. So, if this is now a PSB policy in the future, then maybe they need to be more involved in that process if they're, I don't know who's overseeing it. I guess that's the, that, that's a procedural sort of implementation question, mm -hmm. but like if the policy is designed for us to hopefully have a more consistent approach um, and um, then I don't know, I guess this, this, we need to figure out what are the steps to uh, implementation to make sure that the policy is, does what it's intended to do. Yep. Okay. It does seem to me like this. Some parts of this policy maybe don't aren't necessary to uh, 
to achieve the what I thought was the original goal of having a yearbook policy at all, which is simply to say that uh, not to specify much about the content of the yearbook, but just that uh, if you're enrolled in the school at any point during the year, then you need to be included on an equal footing as everybody else. Right. That was that was really our goal, but it, it's kind of it's metastasized a little bit in, into areas that I, I think maybe aren't strictly necessary for us to address in a policy like the proprietary considerations or, you know, the excluding uh, lewd or offensive things. I mean, does that even need to be part of this policy, given that the goal is simply inclusion and equity? Like, we don't need to go ahead and say what needs, what, what, you know, how, how to run the yearbook, what to put in the yearbook. The point is just, if you do decide to do the yearbook a certain way, then make sure everyone's on an equal footing. Well, I, I think the one potential concern though, is if we don't include what some of the restrictions are on material that would be included, then we run the risk of yearbook staff feeling that they are forced to include something that might not be appropriate. And so I, I, I think that providing these extra levels of clarity can be helpful in that respect. Mm -hmm. The downside just seems to be, as Ms. Lynn has been saying, right, they, they, it does open up unintended consequences and maybe imposes more burdens on the people who are you know, having to hunt down more documentation um, for things. I just think that's going to be necessary regardless, because if we're really trying to make sure that everyone's included, then they're going to have to get those class lists and make sure they're accurate and have that cross-checking. Uh, what, what do others think? I don't know, I kind of feel like we need to have that, uh, that there's a rule against putting certain inappropriate things in otherwise if you say nothing then you're saying it. there's no there's no document to say but this is the rule so to speak i don't know that that's my thought but miss lynn what do you think i would say it's actually a little bit helpful for me i understand that it's hard to define these things and that there are people who are going to like push against it and, and that's okay you know like we can debate what should go in and what shouldn't but for me last year, when I did have to say to some students, you can't say that, well, it was sort of like, well, why not? Mm -hmm. You know, and to have a policy in place actually really helps me defend that position. And that it's not just that I'm saying it and it's how I want things to be, but it's, this is what we have all agreed on. So I, I don't mind that at all. Honestly, okay. I think it's helpful. Yeah. No, if, if you're the one doing the work and you would find it on, on balance helpful, then uh, that's good enough for me. <laughs> I do have one point. I want to bring up is that this conversation reminds me a bit about when we were looking at the dress code policy and whether or not we could restrict, um, let's say, any sayings that were considered lewd um, or, you know, throw in whatever adjective on a student's t-shirt and would we ask a student to, do we have a right as a school to ask a student to take that shirt off or replace it with something like a plain shirt? I just want to make sure we don't, and I think where we landed was no, we could not ask a student because of freedom of speech. And so I wanna make sure that we're not coming up against the same thing here. I'm just wondering maybe, if it's different because we're publishing a book versus like someone, I don't know. I don't yeah, know. I don't either. I just wanna bring know. that up. That's some, that sounds like a town council question. What do you think, David? Because we were pretty, I think we went down the rabbit hole with that one, with the dress code policy. Because our instincts, I think, as educators is like, no, because you're going to offend somebody, you have to take that shirt off. I have an extra, you know, you know, we always have extras, so put the shirt on. And then I think we landed was, no, we couldn't restrict that. Well, I, I think, so the exceptions language, it does say subject to First Amendment rights. So that protection sort of is in there. Just unfortunately, there's no real clear cut way in those determinations and even the case law it's very spe detail specific in yeah. terms of when something contravenes the first amendment and when it doesn't but i think by having that subject to first amendment rights that pr that protection is in there that uh yes that the discretion can prohibit it but not if it goes too far and then okay. and then it's arguable but it's always arguable in, in that realm okay thank you All right, any other thoughts? So what I would like to do is make uh, at least one addition to this draft to cover a lot of uh, what Ms. Lynn was saying. 
So under the inclusion section, I would like to add a point number six, which says something along the lines of the Deputy Superintendent of Student Services shall promulgate procedures to ensure that yearbook editors receive training on this policy and access to any information necessary for compliance with the provisions herein. And so that way, uh, that should hopefully address some of the concerns about uh, knowledge of any court orders that would prevent uh, publication. And again, that can be done in a sensitive way where it's just that someone else looks over any court orders and then removes the name at that level so that yearbook editors don't necessarily know uh, the details of someone's uh, confidential situation. Uh, but that does provide protection for yearbook editors, of course, uh, because I, I, I do understand that concern of, uh, well, I'm trying my best, but if I don't have the information, then how can I really know for sure? Um, I, I don't know what your plan is, but can I add one other thing, one other thought? Um, so the yearbook is a, a very big project. It involves pretty much everyone. You know, you have to like gather all of these materials from all these different places and groups within the school and people. And yeah, it's just a massive project. And I think that um, time is a huge issue. You know, our deadline is actually um, to have all of our pages done in late March. And, and hopefully we'll make that this year um, with, you know, remote learning, it's probably, you know, a little bit more difficult than normal. And in terms of student involvement, there's nothing, uh, it's like I said earlier, it's totally on a voluntary basis. So it would be wonderful if students could, um, and, and I, maybe this isn't on your end, maybe this is more just like a BHS decision. How could students be more officially involved as staff members? Is there any kind of credit that they could gain? And sort of like the, the dream for me would be to have a yearbook course, because I think there's a lot of potential um, that students, uh, there's, there's a lot of potential there for students to learn um, about design, um, about publishing, about photography. I'm, I'm mostly a photo teacher. And so I, I just kind of wanted to toss in that idea. I don't know if that really has anything to do with this policy that you're creating, but I know that we could do a better job and you know, pay closer attention if we were given the time, especially you know, myself and students, I do get a stipend for the extra time that I put in. Um, so, so there is that, but I would love more time with students. Um, and and that, would be, that would be pretty great. Jennifer? So um, I think my suggestion would be to talk to um, your curriculum coordinator um, about the possibility of designing a course like this and, um, you know, talk to your coordinator and your supervisors and uh, or however the process works, maybe it's how, and um, bring it to, you know, usually new courses come to curriculum subcommittee as well. So um, when they get to that level, but it sounds like a really interesting idea. So I would pursue it if you have an opportunity. There might even be some sort of grant that you could write for um, to, to give you time to actually like spend time designing the course as well, like BEF or something. Yeah, thank you for that. I I, I had a feeling that wasn't really, I, I mean, I kind of get that some of this is, but I just kind of wanted to like put that out there. No, that's that's a really cool idea. And I, I think this is something that we all, um, spend time to on, to it on too is trying to figure out the policy versus the procedure piece is one thing that we're is a constant learning curve here um, but that one I think clearly sits in curriculum and um, I would definitely <laughs> and that's my that I chair that committee so I, I feel pretty good about that but it usually comes up from departments so whether that's your department head I'm less familiar with the high school department head curriculum coordinators and um, you know I just think there'll be a lot of interest in that and I see a lot of overlap with um, writing and graphic design and photography and arts and like that could be very cool so I encourage you <laughs> all right great so getting back to edits on the draft before you so I would like to propose that we add that point number six which again the deputy superintendent of student services shall promulgate procedures to ensure that yearbook editors receive training on this policy and access to any information necessary for compliance with the provisions herein. Another change that I would like to make based on this discussion is to uh, eliminate point number two under proprietary considerations. 
that uh, had said identifi identifiable individuals portrayed in any photographs must provide advanced written consent in order for the photographs to be included. That's not very realistic. It would be hard to enforce. I respect that point. It was something that had been raised previously. I simply forgot to remove that. So I, I think I would recommend remove, removing that um, bullet item. And then the third change that I would suggest uh, based on this conversation is to the language of the equity section number three, where instead of the homeschool language, which doesn't refer to what we really intended, that it instead say uh, registered PSB students uh, outside of school who are being provided with services or tutoring by PSB should be offered the opportunity to be represented in the yearbook of their neighborhood school. Uh, and we would have further opportunity to refine that language a bit more if we would like to, if we, if uh, upon a vote by the subcommittee, we end up referring to the full committee. Any other suggested changes or modifications? Um, a very minor one, the, um, uh, the exceptions paragraph about lewd and libelous material, it doesn't seem to quite belong uh, under the current uh, subsection that it's in, which is number two, uh, like IEPs and 504s. Um, yeah. it, it probably should be under the previous paragraph. Yes, you're, you're right. Okay, I agree. So we'll move that to under uh, paragraph one. Yeah. All right. So with those modifications of this draft, I would like to move that we refer this policy to the full school committee. Is there a second? Jennifer seconds. All right, Andy? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. And I also vote yes. All right, so this will very likely be taken up at the full school committee meeting on the 17th for a first reading. And uh, Rob and I'll, I'll get to you a cleaner copy of these changes that we just made right now. All right, so next up for discussion today. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Lynn. Thank you, Ms. Lynn. Well, thank, thank you, everybody. Have a good night. So next up for discussion, uh, school committee roles and norms. Now, this is something that Dimitri had mainly been working on and uh, unfortunately hasn't been able to join us today. Uh, but nevertheless, for those of you have, who have reviewed them and who participated at the full school committee discussion that we had on them, uh, do you have any thoughts about changes you would like to see or anything not currently covered that should be added? There had seemed to be a general consensus with the discussion we had at the full school committee on the norms that in terms of the communication with staff, that it shouldn't necessarily have to be exclusively through the superintendent because that's adding a lot more work for the superintendent, that instead it ought to be uh, considered acceptable for the chair of each subcommittee to uh, act in a sense as a liaison with the corresponding deputy superintendent or other staff person in communicating certain proposals that pertain to that particular area. So I, I think that's something that we were going to add. Jennifer? Yeah, I would agree that was something that I was like, oh, that's that's tricky for me. Like that would be hard to run everything through Dr. Marini um, when setting up. So like I'm thinking about all the email invites that I sent for previous curriculum subcommittee meetings and, and those go directly to staff. So when they get invited, I think, you know, coming to meetings or like coordinating is different than you know, bringing issues maybe directly to a staff member, I think is different than sort of doing the work. Um, I don't know. So I think we should think about that language. I don't know that everything can work that way. I just, I think that things would get really um, clogged up in the works if everything had to get cleared through Dr. Marini. I just think that it would be too hard for him. I, I don't know. I think it would be challenging with the volume of email to sort of sort through all of that and then refer it to different staff. But that being said, you know, it's different to go, going directly to staff for everything. And I, I think that's an area that we've been trying to clarify as a committee. So I do think it's important to get the language right and the intention right. Um, sorry, I've got to pull it back up again on my other screen. There was another, um, there was another piece that I had 
an issue with, uh, not issue, but concern about. So let me look at that if anybody else wants to speak. All right, Andy, was there anything else that you thought we should add to these norms? No, uh, I thought it was pretty much fine. I agree was about the, the, it's very hard to spell out like, how we should be interacting with staff because it's not always that you know, we go to staff with uh well so sometimes it's just a, a very basic like um request for information or understanding where it just you know even though i'm not a subcommittee chair like it just absolutely makes sense for me to talk directly to somebody and it doesn't seem to be a problem and i wouldn't want that to be suddenly become not okay and but i also understand that this can be abused right I agree. So I think maybe we could expand it to not just subcommittee chairs, but also if you are reaching out in connection to a town side committee for or a school committee partner organization like CPAC, and you are the liaison for that entity, uh, I think that would also be appropriate. So like in your case, Andy, you're the liaison for CPAC. So if there's a particular issue that CPAC communicates with you, and you wanted to uh, bring that up to Casey or Maria, at least in my personal opinion, that would be totally appropriate. I'm not sure why you would have to include the superintendent in that or go through me if it's a quick question uh, because it might not even be a policy issue exactly. It could be something else. Uh, so I think that would be fine too, that if you are contacting someone in your capacity as a liaison, that should also be okay. It goes beyond that too, though. For example, like just uh, as one of the um, negotiation subcommittee members, like there's nothing that doesn't come up at some point in negotiations. And so I, I found myself needing to consult with a wide range of, of our professional staff, right? Just yeah. it, it, nothing ideological about it. I just needed information. Um, and it would have been very cumbersome to, to have to go through uh, somebody else. This is fine. And a, a lot of this involves more self-policing on the part yes. of the members because um, I'm not going to name any names, but just overall, there have at times been members who might really demand a lot from staff and be sending out requests every day. And that can become too onerous. But at the same time, I don't think we need to necessarily be creating hard rules around it. I, I think all of us understand that there's a balance where you don't want to be asking for too much, but if it's once in a while requesting information, that shouldn't be a problem and actually is probably helpful in a way because that creates less work for the superintendent. I see no reason why the superintendent needs to be looped into absolutely everything. Um, similarly, something else we had discussed at the full school committee was about norms around responding to emails. To me, I, I personally felt that we are we were sort of trying to create a problem where there isn't one. I, I don't think that we necessarily need to have some type of established procedure for responding to emails. Of course, I think that as a general practice, it would be great if the uh, public received answers to their emails, but there are definitely times where there's a particular issue that's generating a lot of attention and we will all receive literally triple digit emails per day and we obviously can't respond to all of those. Uh, but even if it's just a handful and some of us want to respond and others don't, I think that's better than nothing. And I also think that's better than having to channel everything through one person. Uh, I, now, if we are making some type of broader statement as a committee that probably should go through the chair and have a little more discussion involved in that, but if it's providing information or a personal opinion on an issue, or if it's just more of the uh, I hear you, uh, thank you for expressing your concern type of response. I think we should all be free to do that. But again, that's my personal opinion. Maybe the two of you feel otherwise. No, I, I, I think that if individual people want to respond, then they can. We, we don't have power as a, a committees of one. We only have power as a committee of nine um, to make decisions, but everybody has, you know, their own views. Um, I just worry that if no one responds because you know some weeks or days are harder and you're right when you get over 100 emails in a day it, it's and then it happens for several days in a row it becomes very difficult to dig out of that hole um and so i just worry that people send a message and don't get a response and so we just don't have a good mechanism for making sure some that 
I don't think we have a good mechanism for making sure there is a response. And so yeah. that would be a huge burden on a chair to do that, to respond to a hundred emails every day. I mean, I just think, I just, I don't know what the solution is. And I think flexibility is important, but it's the concern that, you know, being able to be responsive. Um, I don't know. Part of that is that uh, we don't even know whether somebody has responded because you know often we'll get an email that went out to the whole school committee, right? If somebody does respond, they don't copy the rest of us because that would be a violation. Um, and so I have no idea whether uh, whether what a correspondent has been has been attended to or not. Um, so if there was some way of at least being able to know whether a particular message has been replied to by somebody, um, that could be a first step. Um, Yes. I don't even know what that would look like. <laughs> yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> um, David, if, if it's okay, the thing that I had that is sort of related to this is, and maybe that's what we're talking about, because I was trying to find bold spaces, but I, I think it's under in the role of individual school committee members, referring important questions or concern received from members of the community to the superintendent. The superintendent, not any school committee member, has the authority to investigate the superintendent shall provide their response to committee members. It is not the role of the school committee or any of its members to resolve issues. Um, I don't, some of that makes a whole lot of sense to me. And some of that didn't sit right with me either. Um, like the resolving issues. Like, I, and I think that the intention is not operational issues, which is not it, but I, I don't know. So, oh, Andy, I see your hand. Do you have words of wisdom? No. <laughs> No, I was only waving goodbye to Casey. Oh, oh bye, Casey. <laughs> um, I don't know. So I, I don't know. The, just some of the language there was, I don't know. Right. To, to, me, it, to me, it depends on the nature of the problem. There are some issues that it absolutely is our responsibility to try to address it. And then there are right. other ones, if it's something that's more specific as opposed to a broader policy type issue or uh, financial decision, for example, which would be our domain. Um, so it really depends. I, I agree with you. I think we need to have more careful crafting of the language there to delineate uh, what is a school committee responsibility, what is a district responsibility. I think that also goes to part of, like we often get school committee wide emails that are really not in our purview. like specific actions that they want us to take that really are not even things that the school committee would necessarily vote on. And I just think that that speaks to the larger, there's just a lack of clarity and understanding. Um, and I understand why it's there, but there is a lack of understanding of like sort of what is the school district's response? Like what do they, what decisions are they making directly and what kinds of decisions do we make? And I just think there's a lot of confusion. And so I, I just think that maybe perhaps it's helpful to put some of that language in, but it's particularly the last part about, it's not our job to resolve issues, but it sort of is sometimes our job to resolve issues. And so I don't think we can say that. I, I can't vote for that part, but I think the, I think we all, in through our discussions have a closer understanding of what we all mean. I think it's just coming up with the language that really speaks to what it is that we're trying to say. And I don't have that language. I just don't like that line. <laughs> okay. All right, so I think we need to do some more fine tuning on this. It's possible Dimitri's already done so. So perhaps at our, our next meeting, we can pick that up again. Although just as a reminder, we already did refer uh, this policy to the full school committee. Uh, but Suzanne always appreciates when we hash out more of the, the details and then provide a summary for the full committee. Because at a full school committee meeting, it's not very productive to be doing the line by line edits. And, and even at this level, that's not always ideal, but sometimes it's necessary. Okay, so the next item for discussion, and, and this one's very brief, is discussion of the policy manual section D fiscal management. So I've been in touch with Mary Ellen about this. I ran through the entire section, putting in edits. I modeled my edits off of the uh, BFAC report recommendations, off of the uh, Lexington policy, the Cambridge policy, and the Newton policy. So I sort of took, borrowed different elements along with BFAC, put it together. I, I've already written it up. I've shared it with Mary Ellen. Mary Ellen recommended that uh, we hold off into our, until our January meeting to have a more uh, thorough discussion of it. 
And the reason for that is uh, twofold. Uh, first, to just to make sure that she has an opportunity to run through it because a lot of it is very procedural. Even though it's listed in the, in the policy, it's definitely procedure oriented right down to uh, whose signature you get for which account and extremely detailed. So we want her to be able to go through that because she's obviously in the best position to know which of those procedures are still in practice, which ones are obsolete, and uh, she could provide recommendations as to the types of changes that should be made to that portion of the fiscal management policy section. And then similarly, she suggested that Melissa Goff, who is uh, basically her equivalent on the town side, has an opportunity to review it because there are uh, certain portions of it that involve the town side where they sign off on certain things and where they're involved in town school partnership meetings. Once Mary Ellen and Melissa have an opportunity to, to review it, uh, then they're going to get that draft back to me. I'll have it publicly posted for comment and we'll probably take this up at the January meeting. Uh, then uh, Cambridge, it was very interesting, their policy in that they really lay out in detail the budget planning process, which I'm hopeful that we'll include that in our updated policy, because I think that's going to be very helpful. Because oftentimes we've even had school committee members who are sort of wondering about where are we right now in the budget and what are we supposed to be doing next? And Cambridge does a really nice job of laying out sort of uh, in step-by-step -step fashion. Uh, right down to even having a proposed calendar for when certain steps should be achieved. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to implement that. And then the BFAC portion, there are sections in the fiscal management policies that talk about goals and um, evaluation criteria by which we judge our financial decisions. And I thought that was a good place to add a lot of the BFAC recommendations to incorporate them in there because our current policy, it's uh, very vague on uh, in those areas. Uh, Andy, Jennifer, any thoughts or comments? Uh, so the version that we just got, uh, the PDF document, does that already include your changes or is that simply the last year's version? That, that's So that's the current, in, in terms of the uh, fiscal management policies, so that's last year's and then the track changes reflect the edits that I made. Oh, okay. So I don't see any track changes because it's what I got was a PDF, at least for this one. So, uh, okay. Well, yeah, I, I, can, if, I can send it to both of you. So yeah, that'd be great if I could get a Word document. doc so I can see what, what changed. Yeah. So, I, so I'll send that over to the two of you. And obviously the two of you are more than welcome to make line by line edits as well. And then Mary Ellen and Melissa are going to do the same. And then we can all go over it at the next meeting. Uh, because this is something that was identified as really high priority by a lot of people on the town side. So I don't want us to completely forget about it or delay it too much. It was very understandable why we are waiting until this point in the year, given uh, that the pandemic happened like right after BFAC issued its findings. So that created some understandable delay, but I think now is the time to try to uh, bring that back in uh, as, uh, as we continue to pursue other policy modifications as well. Should we bring in Mariah in this process too, since she's the new finance chair um, and yes. will be the so first I, person who has to follow this new policy? So I have copied in Mariah in my correspondence with uh, Mary Ellen and Melissa, and I also okay. asked Mariah to review it. Great. Uh, prior to Mariah becoming chair of finance, we've been having some uh, communication with Susan uh, about this, because obviously this affects the finance subcommittee as well. And uh, Susan was fine with having policy handle this because there is a policy on it, but obviously it should be done in concert with the finance chair. So I would want to make sure that Mariah participates in this uh, as well. Okay. Anything else? All right, so that brings us to new business. And under new business, uh, Suzanne has asked that I bring to your attention, uh, I think you're probably copied on these emails already, that we do have some concern from members of the public around attendance policy with uh, mandatory quarantine periods and when students are marked as absent, even though they're only absent because they are being honest that they have traveled and they have to stay home for a certain period of time as a result. And even though they are accessing school from home, apparently they're still being marked absent. 
Uh, now, based on that representation, that's obviously something that I don't think is appropriate. Uh, so this might be something that we may that we need to take up in policy. Unfortunately, we don't have any um, anyone from central office right now to comment on current attendance procedures. Uh, but I just wanted to bring this to your attention, and this is also something that we may end up discussing at the next policy meeting. Uh, do you have any uh, initial thoughts on this? Jennifer? Um, actually, I don't have a whole lot of initial thoughts because I feel like we need more information. I have seen some of the emails and, um, you know, it. I just think we need more, we would need more information from staff to really understand the complexity of the issue and what, like why things are happening the way that they're happening now and, and what are the reasons. So like if a student, and I'm just thinking of one case in which I think that it makes sense for students to be marked absent if people travel outside of the zone, um, and this is a tricky area, and then have to quarantine because they went into an area where they need to quarantine or get a negative COVID test within whatever, we're gonna say 72 hours or whatever it is. Um, and they can't access, they can't go to school. If you're a hybrid student and you can't go into school, you can't really do that work that you would have done in school remotely necessarily, unless the teacher specifically assigns it to you, in which case you really are missing the instruction. I think it's different if you're remote and you're absent on a remote day and you're gonna be remote anyways, then what's you're already at home and you're accessing your education through Zoom and through some sort of learning management system. I mean, I think that makes less sense. But if I just know in my own experience that it is very hard for a student who's absent on an in-person day to make up that work. They really are absent because they're, even if they can come to one Zoom in the afternoon, like I don't, and, and I'm not, I need to know more about like what's happening in our hybrid model, but I just think there are situations where it doesn't make sense and where are situations where it, it might make sense and we might need to adjust our policy. The attendance policy has been on our list anyways. So, you know, I don't know. So my thoughts are, I think we need to make sure it makes sense, but that I do think there may end up being times when students really do need to be marked absent. Um, or we need to at least have a conversation with staff about what does this look like and what's implementation look like and when are students truly absent and why are they being marked absent if they're working from home. So I just think there's a lot of details and it's a little bit in the weeds. So I, I don't know how far we want to get into it, but I don't know. I think my point is I think staff may have some words of wisdom for us that might help us to understand when we need to create a policy. Does that make sense? I don't know. Yes. Okay. Uh, I do have a problem. So even though students who are absent from in-person learning days are obviously missing out, uh, I, I also don't want to punish honesty because if those same students stayed quiet that they'd been in another state, they would presumably be able to go to school. They would not be marked as absent um, and there would not be the same negative consequences from accruing absences, particularly if it's at the high school level. Uh, so I do worry about that because I, I do want to encourage transparency, especially in a time of a pandemic and not effectively be punishing people for being truthful about their travels and trying to keep others safe. No, I hear you and I get that, except that be, it, this is a really tricky area. And I know, I, I know that this is a very passionate topic for a lot of people and, you know, and I, there is much room for me to be convinced. I'm not, I don't have opinions set in stone, but if people make a choice to travel, there are risks involved with that. And yes, I want people to be honest and do the right thing, which is that if you need to quarantine, you quarantine. But if you make a choice and your child can't go into school because they need to quarantine at the same time, that is a choice that we make. And Yes, we, I think that the choice should not be to go into a school and possibly contaminate someone. And we do want people to be honest, but if you're absent, then you're then you're absent. <laughs> like if you went on vacation to Disney World for a week, you even though we're in a pandemic and you're still absent. Like that was a choice that you made. Like you, I don't know, just you know, it's tr tricky. What if somebody said, Well, I'm gonna be in Florida and I want to, I'm taking we're taking a family vacation and my kid will do half the work, don't mark them absent. Is that are they really present and at school that day or are they absent on, on vacation in Florida? I, I, I'm just saying there's, a, there's a, a lot of gray area here and I think there'll be some debate and we'll have to figure it out. I do want people to be honest, but if you make a choice and you know you're gonna have to quarantine, like then people are making choices, are they not? I mean, it would be different if someone said, I have to go get a medical procedure versus like I'm going on vacation. I don't know, maybe it wouldn't be different, I don't know. 
I'm just saying if kids are not able to access education, then they are absent. I don't know. Andy, any thoughts on yeah, this? I, I agree that I think it'd be worthwhile consulting the staff because for all we know, this, this particular absurdity we're talking about today may just be the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's going on when, when the district is trying to apply pre-pandemic notions of attendance to this situation. Like there may be other things that if, if we knew about them would also strike us as bizarre. So if, if there's any staff who has the full picture of what's going on, you know, how many people are absent and for what reasons, um, right. might be better to address it sort of in context rather than as a separate um, little issue. Yeah, you know what might be helpful too as part of that is like, if there are solutions, like I'd much rather yeah. find a solution to the problem, right? right? And to say, this is the right thing to do or this is gonna be, like, I think we need to determine a policy. But at the same time, I do think what's tricky is if, so let me give you just sort of a theoretical too far in the weeds example. But if, if a teacher is teaching and they are facing students all day long, and then if, they, I don't know if like, if you have to do a Zoom at another time during the day with the other cohort, then when you don't have, I just don't know how the students who are absent on their in-person days will access education because then you're asking teachers to create a third set of plans, which is to turn their in-person instruction into a remote model. Um, and if teachers are teaching different things to different cohorts on a given day, then it may not just be that you can turn on the other cohorts assignments for them because they may be at different points. So I guess what I'm saying is it's a little bit more complicated than just saying you can do these assignments remote because they're missing the instruction that goes with the assignments. So uh, it would be helpful to know if staff, maybe in the Office of Teaching and Learning, have, have an idea about how students could access that work. But I just worry that we'll be asking people who are already overworked to do more work. So that's just a concern I have. I don't know what the solution is, and I'm, uh, but I'm sure we can figure something out. That makes sense. Another thing to possibly address is whether we need to change like what the consequences are for, for absences right, in, in, this, in this situation. Being absent may not amount to quite the same thing as it used to, and you know, it, it, insofar as we penalize people for that, we, we might want to rethink it in some situations. And then also, I think there could be a, a possible in-between approach to Jennifer's point. If you're knowingly making a decision that you know is going to have a certain consequence after the fact, that's different than from doing something out of, because uh, you absolutely were required to an emergency medical procedure. Uh, but there have been some situations that I think were brought to my attention where someone goes out of state and then the rules change again because these rules are constantly changing. So sometimes it's actually, for example, until very recently, it was okay to go to Vermont. And so if a family went to Vermont for a week and they left when it was okay, and then while they're in Vermont, suddenly the rule changes, now they're subject to that quarantine. Had they known before they went on that trip that there would be a quarantine, they wouldn't have gone on the trip and now they're being punished anyway, in a sense. So I, I think that type of situation, I, I would certainly be sympathetic to. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. I mean, it's, this is a, a, a world that flips on a dime. I mean, I, I do think we need to be flexible. I certainly don't want to come off as being inflexible, which is why I said, like, there's certainly room for me to be convinced, but I just know how important it is to get kids, to, for, for kids to be getting the education that they need, especially in this environment. And so I just want to encourage I just want us to have kids in front of educators as much as po possible, so. All right. Uh, are there any other issues that either of you would like to bring up under new business? No? All right. Seeing none, I guess that concludes our meeting for today. So thank you everyone who came and who tuned in and who participated in the chat. I feel that we had a very productive meeting today and uh, we will be meeting again in the second Monday of January.